Hey guys, in this video I'm going to show you a clip from my Steve Albini Big Black interview where he discusses why Big Black did not sign a deal with a major label, the economics of arranging Big Black's tours, and more. If you'd like to see the full Big Black interview I did with Steve Albini, the link is available below. So I guess the practicality of avoiding all this extra bureaucratic yellow tape, is that partly why you guys didn't want a major label deal? Well, I mean, there are a couple of things at play there. Like, in the beginning, when I was doing Big Black all by myself, if I had sent those demos or those records out and a big record label had approached me and said, hey, we want to sign you to our big record label, I would have signed the first fucking thing that anybody waved in front of me. Of course I would have. You know, I was, I, I was stone fucking ignorant. I would have signed literally the first thing anybody waved at me. I would have signed it, right? But as I got more involved in the music scene, the social environment of the music scene, I got to see how other bands related to their record labels and what problems they started to express. And I started to see the ways that those relationships could go sour. And extrapolating from that, uh, I started to see how small bands on big labels were really badly treated, meaning they weren't taken seriously by the big record labels because they had a small audience and they were going to be unprofitable. Uh, and it just didn't seem like it was a worthwhile endeavor. Like it didn't seem like any, like no big record label could help a band that was only going to be selling a few thousand records. A big record label would only ever be a problem in that regard. Like if, you know, if, if your band is selling less than 10,000 records, you know, a big record label is going to see that as a as a horrific embarrassment and immediately try to put you out of business, you know, immediately try to kill your band, right? But if you're doing it on your own, selling records out of your house or whatever, selling 10,000 records is a big fucking deal. Like you can make, you know, that's 40 or $50,000 that you'll make out of that one record, you know, and that's that's a sustainable existence for a band to put records out on that scale. So if you if you keep things small and keep things under your own control, you can be a lot more efficient about it. And if you get involved with a big system, like the, a big industry that expects large numbers and high turnover and profit margins, then you're just going to disappoint those people and you're going to be viewed as a failure and the whole process is going to is going to be uncomfortable. So we just avoided it because it I mean, being fair, we didn't get a, we didn't get offered that much stuff. Like we would occasionally be approached by somebody at a who had an office at a big record label and we just told them we weren't interested. Um but it didn't it's not like you know, it's not like we were Chance the Rapper or something where we were like the you know, this like Pro, this plum waiting to be plucked to sell millions of records like that just wasn't it just it, that wasn't our world so what were those early days like for you guys um you know i read that you guys are sometimes touring you sleep on people's floors you're crammed into cars like what was that experience like kind of just going from the ground up? i mean all of that stuff is just practical like you know if you're you book a you'd book a tour and you have a list of shows and you'd know pretty much how much you were going to be making on the tour so you just work backwards from that. Like, well, how much can we spend? Well, we can only spend this much if we're going to come home with a profit. And I'm pretty proud of the fact that I've made a profit on every tour I've ever been on, you know, just in a sense that we were aware of our limitations and we were comfortable working within them. Like, if you know you're only going to draw 100 people and that means you're only going to make a couple hundred bucks on the show, then you don't blow 70 or 80 of it on a hotel room. You just find a place to stay where it's not going to cost you anything. That's a purely practical matter. And I mean, and every band of our, <clears throat> every band in the underground operated the same way. Like everybody shared information with each other and everybody hosted each other. So like if we, if we played in, in Wisconsin, for example, you know, we might stay with members of Killdozer or we might, you know, crash it at the house of the radio DJ that got us the gig or something like that. Uh, if we played in, in Minneapolis, there were, you know, there was a, a sort of a fraternity of bands up there that we were sort of loosely affiliated with. And so we could all just scatter and stay at their houses. Like 
the idea of getting a hotel room for your band to stay in seemed like a like an absurd indulgence that just nobody did. Like just literally nobody did that. I heard that you also you used to if it's if it's correct what I read it, you used a double pick and you wrapped like coil around it or something. So I used metal picks, um, picks made out of spring copper, and I have a friend who has a. Um, sheet metal punch and he punches a little notch in the tip of the pick so the picks have two points on them um, I don't have one on me otherwise I could show you but it's it looks like a normal guitar pick except made out of metal and uh, it's very thin very springy metal and then the tip of it has a little crescent shape notched out of it so that it has two points on the end um, so when you hit the string it hits it twice and when you and because it's made out of metal, it's a very like sharp attack, very snappy, zinging attack. Um, and it's just, I I got into the habit of using them because they, they, the physical sensation of playing, um, has a their tactile response of it suits my playing style, and the feedback of that, like, helps me establish a rhythm in my playing. That's so cool. Was that a typical thing in the underground punk scene in Chicago, or was that unique to you? No, it was just me fucking around with different methods and finding something that I liked and hanging on to it. I mean, that's true of literally everything about my guitar playing. I'm, I'm not being modest here. I'm a, an extremely limited guitar player. Like I, I don't, I, I don't have the kind of skills that a typical guitar player would have because I didn't learn in a typical fashion. I learned how to tune the guitar, and then I've taught myself essentially everything else. And uh, I I never played in a cover band, so I never had to learn other people's songs. Um, I I never took formal guitar lessons, so I never learned any of the tropes or tricks that uh, are kind of standard to guitar playing. I've just developed a style of playing that I can make use of in my own music. Uh, I have a limited set of skills, but they are finely honed specifically for the kind of music that I play. And the same is true with my equipment. Like I, I play, I'm playing a Travis Bean guitar now. That's the same guitar I've played for 25 years. I've only played that guitar for 25 years. So I know it intimately. Like I know, I know precisely where to put my hand to grab the toggle switch to make the toggling noise or, you know, it, like the the physical contours of that guitar are kind of built into my style of playing. Um, so I, I don't have, you know, I'm not a versatile guitar player and I'm not skilled in the conventional sense, but uh, for the kind of music that I play, I have a pretty highly developed sense of how to do that kind of music. It's been a long time. Would you say that your guitar playing has stayed more or less the same, or has it evolved or developed in a, in any way? What I'm into as a as a person has changed. So my style of guitar playing has changed in the you know commensurate with that, but um, in parallel with that, you know I don't I don't know if I would be capable of executing the stuff that's on the big black records. I haven't tried. But I don't know if I would be able to do it just because I'm no longer playing in that idiom every day, you know. But by the same token, if the band I'm in now, Shellac, if you tried to get 1980s me to play that music, I don't think I could have done it then. So I want to ask you a technical question. One of my favorite songs from Big Black is Kerosene. And in particular, after you you yell, set me on fire, there's that screeching guitar sound i think it's a guitar honestly it's just a guitar through an amplifier like i have an odd guitar um it's a single coil guitar guitar with single coil pickups and the pickups were out of phase and i played through a transistor amplifier called an ivp santiago had a telecaster but he always played through um, a distortion pedal and a fender twin uh, typically, and his guitar sound was always extremely dark and very gnarly. Uh, 